Hello and thank you for joining me here at Why the Book Wins, where I compare books with their movie adaptations. My name is Laura and today I am talking about The Uninvited, which is a book by Dorothy McArdle published in 1941. It was originally published under the title Uneasy Freehold, but then it was republished under the title The Uninvited and that is what it is most well known as. And I will be comparing it with the movie The Uninvited from 1944, directed by Lewis Allen. And there is a 2009 movie, I believe, called The Uninvited, but that is completely unrelated and has nothing to do with this story here. And this is the Wednesday before Halloween. So happy Halloween to everybody. I decided to get even more in the spirit by dressing up in a way, <laughs> even though this like Victorian Gothic getup has nothing to do with the uninvited because it takes place in the 1930s. And so this look doesn't fit, <laughs> but I decided to wear it anyway. And in fact, this would be very fitting for Dracula because these earrings have bats on them. So I haven't covered Dracula yet, but whenever I do, I will be reprising this look. So yeah, comment down below what you are dressing up as this year. If you are dressing up and you can also comment down below what your favorite Halloween book is or what your favorite Halloween movie is. And if you have not seen The Uninvited you should definitely add it to your Halloween movie list because I did really enjoy this movie and before I get into the comparison of book first movie I want to warn you that as always there will be spoilers for both the book and the movie in this episode and then also let you know that this is available as a YouTube video as well as a podcast. I have both. You can check either one out. But a brief overview of the story. So we have a brother and sister named Roderick and Pamela who buy this house in the country overlooking the ocean and, and it is available for a very good price and when they talk to the owner who is referred to as the commander he basically tells them in so many words that people suspect the house is haunted by his daughter who died there named Mary but they're just kind of like you know that's ridiculous we'll buy it anyway. Of course once they move in they realize that there is a spirit there and then the commander's granddaughter Stella Mary's daughter when she visits the house she feels the presence of Mary and feels that motherly presence and the love and the warmth as well as just this other weird negative presence too. So there's like two different feelings going on and they realize it is because there are two ghosts there. We have Mary, Stella's mother, but then we also have the spirit of Carmel who died a few weeks after Mary died. And Carmel was the mistress of Mary's husband. And so that is the overall premise of this story. And onto the book review. So I will just straight up say that I did not like this book. I liked the premise and I thought the plot was good. People talked about like there is a reveal that happens and people said that they saw the reveal coming like a mile away and it was so obvious. I didn't. <laughs> so it caught me by surprise. However, the book was just not written in an exciting page turning, suspenseful, thrilling way. Like it just felt like it dragged on and on. And then by the time things really started to pick up. I was just so ready for it to be done that I just like didn't even care that exciting things were happening. I just wanted it to be over. So it wasn't even a slow burn because with slow burns you feel that building tension but there was no building tension here and yeah it was just very disappointing and it just felt kind of tedious. And there's a number of like occurrences that happen in the house that should have felt like exciting and climactic like all these mini climaxes but I just was not feeling anything when I read this book to be honest. However, there are people who give this really good reviews and there are people who are say that it was exciting and thrilling and suspenseful. So I don't know what my problem was, but I just was not feeling it when I read this book. Like I said, it wasn't terrible and there were aspects of it that I did like, but ultimately it's not one I would recommend because it was tough for me to get through. And there were times I did not want to finish it, but I did finish it because I really wanted to watch this movie and cover it. And, and I had already posted my book first movie schedule saying I would cover it. So I felt like I had to, because that's what I was telling people I was going to do. Anyway, I was happy to finish it because it gave me the chance to watch the movie. And speaking of the movie, so the book first movies I've done this month, The Uninvited, Haunting of Hill House, and Rebecca all have some similarities there. They all deal with like a haunted house, which has a name, you know, Hill House, Mandalay, and here it's called Cliff End, but in the movie they switch it and call it Windward. And then The Uninvited and Rebecca in particular just have a lot of similarities with well, actually Hill House 2 has like this creepy older woman, like varying degrees of creepiness in all three of them. All three of them are black and white movies. All three are written by women, but that wasn't entirely intentional. Some of that was just coincidental. But the reason I wanted to watch The Uninvited and read The Uninvited is because I had remembered seeing this movie when I was like 15 and loving it, around 15, my early teens, but I could not remember the name of it. I didn't remember what actors were in it. Like I had remembered it had some kind of generic name and I knew it wasn't black and white and that it was about a haunted 
haunted house. And I remembered that they, when in, when they're in the house, that there was a scent they kept smelling. I thought it was lavender, but it's actually mimosa. Anyway, so based on that limited information that I had, I was finally able to locate it, which was very exciting. And then I saw it was based on a book. So that is why I chose to cover this one. However, after I finished the book, I was looking for the movie and it is not available to stream anywhere. It is not available on YouTube. And so I had to buy the DVD and luckily I found our dusty old DVD player and I was able to watch it that way. So I also couldn't find the remote. So then I got the DVD. I had the DVD set up, but then I didn't have a remote for the DVD player. So it was quite the ordeal just to watch this movie. But if you have a DVD player and if this is available at your local library or if you want to buy it, I would recommend it. I really wish it was streaming, but anyway, it was quite the adventure just to be able to watch this movie again for the first time since my early teens. Anyway, all in all, I really enjoyed this movie and I would highly recommend it. I thought it was creepy and entertaining and it did have some building suspense, which the book lacked. And it also had like some funny moments too, which I have mixed feelings about, but anyway. So getting into the story and the characters and the differences. So I will start with Roderick, who in the book they call him like Rod or Roddy, but but in the movie, they call him Rick. I'll just call him Rick as well, since that's what the movie does. But in the book, Rick is a is a play critic, but he wants to be a playwright. And in the movie, he is like a concert critic, but he wants to be a composer. And in the book, so he has a play he wants to write. And so they move out to this home so he can be away from the hustle and bustle of the city and have time to focus on his play. And he ends up writing a play from start to finish in record time. And he feels like, you know, after the fact, he realizes he was like influenced by the presence of the house and it inspired him to write this story and caused him to be able to write it so quick. And the story like is about a woman who is like obsessed with power and, you know, wrecking those lives around her to get what she wants and to have the power she wants. And this later clues them in into the truth about these two ghosts in the home. Whereas in the movie, he is a pianist, he is a composer, and there is a part where he is playing a song for Stella and it begins to get sad. And she's like, oh, like, why is that so sad suddenly? And he's like, I don't know, it just happened. So he is like influenced by the presence to write a sad song. But the sad song doesn't clue him in into the mystery, whereas in the book, his play clued them in into what was going on. And in both book and movie, there's a part in both where like a room called the studio is like, has the strongest feeling to it. And in both, there's a part where he's in there and he starts to feel so depressed and questioning himself and just doubting himself and feeling depressed. And he realizes is it is because of the presence in this room, which by the way, in the movie, when they walk into the studio, like it's an amazing, <laughs> room with this fantastic view of the ocean and they walk in and they're like well this room is a dump <laughs> and they're like not even the view can save it this room sucks and they're complaining about the windows even though the windows are huge and amazing so I was like have like how styles change that much because that room looks awesome like it has an amazing view like what more could you want <laughs> But anyway, so I thought it was funny that they said how horrendous the room was, even though I thought it looked awesome. But again, they were like influenced by the presence. So maybe like the presence there caused them to think the room was terrible. And then to move on to Stella, who is a very important character. So her grandfather is just very controlling. She's 20 years old, but he treats her like she's younger and just he doesn't want her going to cliff end slash windward. But Stella decides to disobey him. He also doesn't want her to befriend Roderick or Pamela, but she decides to dis disobey him and she shows up at their house any Way. And when she's there, she feels the presence of her mother and just that warmth. And she feels the knowledge that her mom loved her. But then at the same time, she also feels like this negative energy and it causes her to like run out to the cliff where there's this tree and she almost falls over, but then Roderick saves her. And by the way, we find out that is how her mother died as she ran out to the cliff and fell over and died. And in the book, after one of her visits to the house, she collapses. It might've been this first time, might've been another time, but she collapses at the house. And then when they bring her back to her home, home, they hear from this doctor that Stella has been acting strange. And one minute she'll be like her sweet self. And then the next minute she is just like going into a rage. And so there's a character named Dr. Scott who is caring for her. And so he is medicating her and putting her on a lot of drugs to help her sleep and stay calm. And this is not in the movie. So Stella, she visits the house, she collapses. And then instead of having her stay with the commander, the commander has her be sent to Miss Holloway's mental institution. Miss Holloway being a woman who was 
was very good friends with Mary. And so she started this like holistic mental retreat. And so the commander has Stella sent there because he's worried about her. I mean, he acts like he's worried about her mental stability, but really he's just trying to control her and keep her away from the house. And Roderick and, and Pamela are initially very annoyed that the commander is trying to control her and keep her away. But then after she faints at the house and after all this happens and after she runs to the cliff, Roderick is like, wow, you know, the commander was right. She probably shouldn't come here. And so they no longer want Stella there either because they can see that she is too heavily influenced by like these presents that are there. And then as far as Miss Holloway goes, so in the book, they hear about Miss Holloway and how she was there when Mary died and she lived with them and she knew the whole situation and how she has this like holistic mental retreat. So they go to talk to her and she tells them about Mary and what a saint she was. And she was such an amazing person and Carmel was so evil and terrible, but Mary was just so kind that she allowed Carmel to live with them anyway. And then she tells them about how after Mary died, Carmel got really sick and Miss Holloway herself cared for Carmel, but Carmel ended up dying nonetheless. And in the book, after they are done seeing Mrs. Holloway, Miss Holloway, they talk about like how cold she was and how like, it seemed like she wasn't telling the full truth and that she just seemed like a bad person. And in the book and movie, Mary is just remembered as being like the saintly woman. Like I said, her husband was having an affair with Carmel and yet she allowed Carmel to stay in their house as a way to show what a good person she was. But also she said she felt like it was her husband's job to send Carmel away, not hers. And so everybody looked up at her as being just so charitable and so kind and look what she's putting up with. And then the commander also like idealizes Mary because that was his daughter. And it almost seems like he just has like stuff relating to Mary, like surrounding Stella's room, like trying to get her to be as much like Mary as possible. And so Stella just feels like she can never compare and she will never be as good as her mother and she will never be as beautiful as her mother because the father was a painter and so he had painted Mary and she was just this beautiful woman and so Stella just like feels suffocated by the memory of her mother and yet at the same time she likes going to cliff end and feeling that presence and that warmth and that love but then it's always followed by a negative presence which confuses her and in the movie though with Miss Holloway they definitely gave her more of a role because like I said in the book she's just in that one scene when they talk to her whereas in the movie they they talk to her like they do. But then Stella was also living there in that house because the commander sent her there. And so we see them to interact and how Miss Holloway does not like Stella. And Roderick and Pamela had told her, Miss Holloway, about the influence the house had on Stella and how she had almost ran over the cliff, but he had to save her. And so later after the interview was over, Stella is telling her how she wants to go home and she's fine, she doesn't need to be here. And so Miss Holloway is like, you know what? Yeah, you can leave. And why don't you go back to uh, Windward slash Cliff End? which in the movie it's Windward and this only happens in the movie. But anyway, so she tells her to go back to Windward. And so she sends Stella on the train to go back home. Meanwhile, Roderick and Pamela are on their way to Miss Holloway's to pick up Stella. And so when they show up, Miss Holloway is like, she already left, she's going back to Windward. And Miss Holloway kind of goes crazy and starts like talking about how she hopes Stella will die and how like, basically she had like this obsession with Mary, which was very similar to Mrs. Danvers and Rebecca. And so when they leave to go get Stella, we see Miss Holloway just kind of talking crazy and her assistant is trying to be like calm her down basically and so that was very different from the book because we didn't have that scene at all and I wonder if like the movie was inspired by the success of Rebecca that they wanted to make Miss Holloway more similar to Mrs. Danvers so that's what it seemed to me but it could be because I literally just read and watched Rebecca and so it's in my head <laughs> so maybe it was unintentional but it seemed a bit too similar the two characters so it seemed like they were trying to emulate Miss Danvers with her character. But the big reveal in this book is that we find out Mary was not Stella's mother and that it was actually Carmel. And so the story is, you know, Carmel and Mary's husband were sleeping together and she got pregnant. And so the three of them went to Paris and then eventually Carmel gave birth to a daughter and they took the daughter and were like, uh, we're going to say this is our baby. And they left Carmel there, came back to uh, England, but then Carmel just couldn't bear being away from her daughter. So she returned to try to get her daughter back. But the town gossip said that Carmel Carmel returned because she was still in love with the husband, even though that wasn't the truth. But when Stella realizes that Carmel is actually her mother, she realizes this this while they're in the house and Carmel can finally be put to rest because Stella knows who her true mother is. And she was the one that would be crying at night, but now she no longer needs to cry at night because she finally has that connection with Stella, which she had been wanting all along. And Stella finally knows who her real mom is. And then in the end of the book, Mary's spirit makes another appearance and Roderick has this final showdown with her and tells her like, you know, we know the truth about you. We're not scared about you anymore, scared by you anymore. And this like gets rid of her out of the house finally. But to circle back, 
back to that studio with like the huge windows. One of the reasons that one just had a strong, you know, spirit presence or whatever was because the husband was a painter, right? And he would paint Carmel. And so he had a painting of Carmel where she looked very lovely. But then when they left her in Paris and came back with her baby saying it was theirs, Carmel came back to get her baby, but she just looked so like rugged and tired and drained emotionally and physically. And she just looked terrible. And so Mary was telling the husband, like, we need to get rid of her. And the husband was like, I know what'll do it. And so he ends up painting her. She doesn't know she's being painted, but like he'll study her at dinner and then he'll go up to a studio and paint her. And so then when he reveals the painting to her of her looking so horrible, like she is just like embarrassed and horrified. And so that is why that room in particular has such like a heavy feel to it was because of that experience of seeing her humiliation with this painting. And that was left out of the movie. And then with the romantic relationships in this movie. So in the book, Stella and Roderick definitely like had a thing going. And then in the book, Dr. Scott had a thing for Pamela. However, in the book, Roderick, he notices Dr. Scott likes Pamela, but he thinks to himself like, I hope Scott gets over it because Pamela just isn't into him. So it'd be best if he just got over her sooner rather than later. However, in the movie, in the end, we see that Stella and Roderick are going to get married and that Pamela and Scott are in love, which was totally random in the movie. They hadn't like had any love going on. And then suddenly at the end, it's like here, they're all happily paired up. <laughs> but I thought it was interesting in the book, the fact that Pamela was choosing to be single and didn't seem interested in any guys. And Roderick himself is thinking about, you know, like, oh, you know, Pam's such a great person. I hope she does find someone someday. But by the end of the book, she still is just happily single. And when it comes to book first movie, the movie wins <laughs> for me. I just, yeah, I did not find the book suspenseful or thrilling at all. And the movie, you know, it did a good job building the tension, but it also had some like comedic moments, which were funny, but then at the same time, like to the film's detriment, I felt like that ruined some of the tension, you know, because it breaks the tension by having the audience laugh. So I don't mind humor in like scary movies, but I feel like they could have done without that probably in this and kept it more of a thriller and more of a, you know, ghost story. Story. But nonetheless, it didn't like ruin the experience for me and I still really liked it. And they actually used some graphics to create like this misty looking ghost figure, which was very impressive for the time. And they did make some big changes to Miss Holloway. Like I said, they made her more like Mrs. Danvers in my mind, but I didn't mind that. I thought it was fine that they beefed up her character and made her a bit crazy and unstable. And then they also just like condensed the story and there were a lot of characters they just got rid of like Roderick's and Pamela's friends in London. We don't see them at all. We're Whereas in the book, her, their friends in London are visiting them and they go visit London and they have a housewarming party and there's just more to it. There is also a part where one of their friends from London visits them and she sees her face in the bathroom, I think in the studio bathroom or somewhere. And she sees her face looking like an old woman and it freaks her out. So that was left out of the movie. But I was fine with the changes they made, honestly, because I just didn't like the book. So it was almost a guarantee that I would like the movie better. And... Yeah, I just thought it was more exciting and I thought it was really well done and, and I thought it holds up really well today. So I would definitely recommend this movie. Like I said, it is only available on DVD so you can see if your local library has it or you can just buy it. And I think it would be a great one to watch this Halloween season. And thank you for watching this video, listening to this podcast. Don't forget to give it a rating and review for the podcast. And if you're on YouTube, don't forget to like and subscribe, comment your thoughts down below. Let me know if you have seen this movie. It's not like the best movie for me to be covering because it's so hard to come across. I should probably be covering movies that are more accessible to the audience, but I wanted to cover this anyway, partly because nostalgia reasons, because I'd remembered watching it and loving it so much at the time. And yeah, it was so exciting to just finally find it and be able to watch it again. But anyway, happy Halloween. Thank you for watching and I will see you next time. Bye.